with Swatej Pawar. The Grasslands Trust, which is based out of Pune, is one of the only organizations in India working towards the conservation of grasslands. Beyond grassland restoration and conservation, they are also working on monitoring and conserving the species found in these landscapes, which includes the Indian grey wolf and striped hyenas. Tune in to listen more. So welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you guys here to talk about the work being done by the Grassland Trust. So my first question is, what was the idea behind the Grasslands Trust? Yeah, um, so the idea behind the Grasslands Trust, so I'll just give you a brief background about how it all started. So uh, back in 2009, uh, there were three people who, from Pune, my teammates, uh, who started exploring the surroundings of our city, Pune in Maharashtra. And um, they they happened to spot some Indian wolves out there. And uh, so at that time, uh, tiger tourism was booming. It is even right now. Um, but no one actually was monitoring these habitats around cities, which were mainly uh, non-protected. And no one knew a lot about the wildlife that existed there. And so we thought, um, instead of just doing what everyone else is doing by just going to tiger reserves and doing photography and filming there, instead, uh, we we thought that it might be worth exploring these grasslands and analyze the needs of conservation and awareness over here. So that was the idea behind uh, starting the trust, actually. So the teams uh, soon expanded from three people to 15 people. And uh, we are three trustees. And uh, we have some people working with us, like my teammate Makran, who is also uh, part of this podcast. And uh, yeah, now uh, we are collaborating with with, uh, different NGOs and uh, local communities, uh, different government bodies like the Forest Department, uh, local corporations, etc. to work on field in Pune district. So why are grasslands such an important ecosystem? So, um, as a habitat, uh, grasslands sequester carbon. Um, and as compared to trees, some scientists believe that grasslands are actually a more um, reliable source for storing carbon. For example, when trees get burnt, a lot of the carbon gets released into the atmosphere. But grasslands are more reliable in terms of even if they catch fire, uh, the carbon stays stored underground uh, safely as compared to trees. Uh, so that's that's one point why grasslands are important. But as an ecosystem, uh, there's there's a huge uh, biodiversity that exists in grasslands, which includes mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and there's a whole food chain. So um, like, just, just for an example, so that everyone can relate, um, like tiger is the apex of predator of, of its food chain in forests. The Indian wolf is an apex predator here in the grasslands. So the wolf preys on uh, chinkara, means the Indian gazelle, black buck. It also scavenges. But then uh, black bucks and chinkara, they feed on grasses. And there are birds who eat the insects which uh, belong to these grasses. And that's how the whole food chain is uh, in balance. So, uh, and there are, as I said, there are reptiles and amphibians. The reptiles like the saw-scaled viper, amphibians, um, uh, like the marbled balloon frog, uh, other reptiles like the leopard gecko, which is stunning to look at. Um, and uh, and another extremely important part of grasslands is that uh, we people uh, and communities have been depending on grasslands uh, for our agriculture, uh, for crops like wheat, millets, pomegranate, and nowadays, the grasslands are also being dominated by sugarcane. Um, and there is a large community of pastoralists who depend on these grasslands for their livelihood. They have a lot of livestock. Um, and uh, nowadays, there are the grasslands also provide some ecotourism opportunities for locals. Um, so we've actually been working with the forest department and the locals to uh, start some ecotourism uh, uh, ecotourism ventures in the grasslands and of course other NGOs have also been chipping in so something like a grassland safari might soon be rolling through the forest department so the grasslands trust works predominantly in Pune's grasslands could you just introduce us a bit to these grasslands 
So um, around Pune, uh, there, there, Pune has been blessed with different habitats. So uh, Pune, as you might know, it, it, it has part of the Western Ghats as well. So we have the Ghats area where there are mountains and hills and the majority of the rainfall and the clouds basically, which come in due to the westerly winds, they get blocked on uh, at these mountainous sites. And so whatever is left of these uh, monsoon winds and it, it sort of gets rolled on to these grasslands and there is scarce rainfall on the grasslands. Um, and Pune has both. So it has the Western Ghats and the grasslands as well where there is scarce rainfall. Um, and that's why basically grasslands are here because that area receives less rainfall. Uh, the habitat has been uh, has evolved uh, in a way which requires less rainfall. And that's why it's dominated by grasses uh, and there are less trees over there. So around Pune, there are areas like Saswad, Morgao, Paramati, Chakan. Uh, so these are, the, these are just some areas around Pune which have grasslands. And uh, otherwise, even apart from Pune, we, not that we uh, work only in Pune district, now, we, we do have uh, wildlife trackers who actually work in other districts of Maharashtra. So there are places like Indapur, Satara, Ahmednagar, Dhure, Solapur, where a lot of uh, enthusiast wildlifers have been tracking wildlife. And soon uh, we plan to incorporate their findings and their work into some conservation projects across the state. In India, grasslands are often considered as wastelands. Why is this the case? I think uh, I'll, I'll hand over uh, the talk to Makran, my teammate, who is uh, who is the, a project coordinator for our recent grassland restoration project. So he'll be able to explain to you better about uh, grasslands as a habitat and why they're uh, treated as wastelands in India. Over to you, Makran. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the origin of the word uh, wastelands for uh, grasslands uh, has financial reasons, actually. Uh, in the time of Britishers, they looked at the Indian landmass and identified areas that were of economical benefit to them, which included timber, logging business and timber industry. And obviously, since on the grasslands, you cannot find that many trees, they were considered wastelands from financial point of view, because there was no harvest of timber possible on grasslands. And that legal notification has just been carried over uh, post-independence and that's why in our current uh, land notification we still call grasslands as wastelands. Uh, they are not wastelands obviously, they were waste in terms of their monetary importance to the Britishers but uh, as an ecosystem they are far from being uh, wasteland. They play a vital role in local economy, local community as well as of crucial importance to wildlife which uh, lot of it has specialized to live uh, solely on grasslands so uh, from from that aspect uh, maybe we will cover it later during one of our uh, tgt projects but we have also undertaken uh, a pilot project uh, near pune where we are attempting grassland restoration but maybe we can cover it uh, during tgt's projects that if we talk about go ahead explain what the grassland restoration pilot project is about yeah yeah okay so uh as vishwadesh mentioned in the early days of uh, tgt tgt was exploring around pune and there is a place called kendur near alandi north of pune where tgt was monitoring a wolf pack and during those uh expeditions out there uh tgt got familiarized with local community and the sarpanch of that place expressed interest in uh, developing grasslands for fodder requirement of their uh, livestock. That particular village of Kendur is well known for its dairy business. Uh, so having good availability of naturally growing fodder that can be harvested and fed to wild livestock was of importance to them. What they had observed is that there was a lot of uh, tree plantation and revegetation happening around Kendur, but most of those trees were not palatable for uh, animals. They were good in terms of that they had grown to a certain extent. But uh, beyond that, they had no value in terms of palatability. Another aspect that had happened and has happened in many places around Pune and Maharashtra is that 
there is a, an imbalance of grass species so some type of grass species uh, have dominated the landscape and some other types of grass species have reduced in number and that has many reasons like uh, overgrazing or annual fires or land erosion and so on and the species that currently remain dominant are also of the kind who have uh, you know spiky seeds in uh, their dry form making it non palatable for wild wildlife as well as for livestock during the dry season where the most requirement for the fodder is in during the wet season the fodder requirement is not that much because even these grasses who will eventually have spiky seeds can be consumed in their young wet form so in the dry form we have shortage of uh, fodder that can be harvested and hence we uh, wanted to look at restoring a patch of grassland near pune where we can introduce some new species of plants uh, in that area by new i mean uh, new saplings like new plantation uh, these plants this uh, grass species that we were going to introduce or we have introduced are still native in the sense that they are present in our area but they have gone down in number so from that point of view we had uh we were very fortunate to have some good collaborations to guide us in this uh, project uh organization called etri from bangalore is our main collaborator in this and from a subject matter expertise point of view we have been very fortunate to have uh, ex forest retired forest officer subhash badwe who retired as a cf from maharashtra forest Uh, he is a pioneer in some of the grass restoration projects and very well versed with the uh, grasses so he was of guidance to us in this uh, project and uh, it was several months long project uh, starting with creating grass nurseries uh, because grass seeds if you just first of all grass seeds of the kinds that we wanted are not available easily it's not like you can go to market and buy grass seeds so you have to have uh, some source of grass seeds even if you have grass seeds just uh, distributing them on the land is very inefficient because they will probably uh, not get rooted in the uh, in the intended area they might just simply get blown away by the wind and may take root somewhere else or may simply get lost and not never germinate so tossing seeds was not an option so we had to develop a nursery which uh, again we were fortunate enough to have the campus of ferguson uh, botanical garden under deccan education society it's in central pune there under the guidance of uh, mr sunil bhide sir we developed a grass nursery of around 10000 grass saplings of various varieties and these varieties mainly include perennial species like uh, i will tell you the marathi names for it uh, anjan dhaman dongri sheda and marvel in scientific term there are other names for these xenchurus ciliaris is anjan and so on so from the rahuri uh, campus of pune university uh, we got some what is known as root slips which is just the root part of the grasses and we sowed them in bags and we developed a nursery at the same time from uh, mamdapur nashik forest division in mamdapur we had a forest department nursery where they have also developed some perennial grass species uh, of the same kinds so we got some saplings from there as well and taking those we have uh, planted around 10000 saplings on the field right now and uh, they have established well so far uh, within the next year they will be provided full protection meaning uh, they will be product protected from wild fires there will be no grazing allowed and after one or two years of uh, this protection they should be well established in the ground and then they can be even in their dry form during the summer time they can be uh, cut and uh, harvested another interesting thing i would like to mention here about grasslands that uh, we should also pointed out as grasslands being carbon sequesters uh there are two types of photosynthesis that happen in the plant world there is a c3 photosynthesis and c4 photosynthesis 
and uh, only about 3% of the known plant species have the capability to do c4 type of photosynthesis which is more efficient and it requires three times as much as less water than c3 type of photosynthesis and all these grasses that we have planted are also c4 grasses which are the more efficient kind and they are more resilient to drought they require less water they grow fast and they are uh, more efficient in terms of sequestering carbon than most other plants uh, 97 than 97 percent of the plant life so that's something also unique about these plant species they are perennial as well which means once established they will continue growing every year being perennial their roots are also well formed they will hold more soil in a better fashion and they're rent fed they don't need any external you know irrigation they are just dependent on rain water the rest of the season they can survive without any rains or occasional rains as seasonal rains might come in so from these aspects these grasses are pretty interesting they have very interesting properties and uh, although ephemeral grasses or annual grasses are equally important because they also have their own part in the habitat this imbalance of annual grasses versus perennial grasses that has taken place in our area uh, we wanted to uh, sort of see by introducing these perennial types of grasses if we can uh, restore the grassland and improve it and it's you know long term project we will have observations taken over the next 5 10 years and uh, we will see how this uh, project goes but we are hopeful that it will satisfy the requirements from the wildlife point of view as well as from the local community point of view so what are some of the main threats to india's grasslands uh so as far as threats to grasslands are concerned there are several things that can be talked about one thing is developmental pressure uh, by that i mean infrastructure development in terms of uh, building personal properties or taking up grasslands for you know energy projects uh, like solar projects or windmill projects and so on uh, obviously if you have a patch of forest if you want to develop something there it has a bigger psychological impact right like having to cut down trees to build something has a bigger psychological impact and uh, more of a natural avoidance to do that but grasslands unfortunately right now are not looked at that way they are considered like uh, absence of life and since they are just grasses they are easily taken up for development so that is one clear risk for grasslands uh other risks involve uh, grazing pressure around 30 to or almost almost 50 years ago actually uh grazing of private cattle on public lands used to have some tax associated with it and that tax was supposed to be used for maintenance of these grasslands and development of them but uh, at some point that tax was taken away and now there is absolutely no money uh, that comes in from the cattle grazing that happens on the public lands on, on the grasslands which can be used to keep that quality or that fodder potential of the grasslands intact so that does not happen anymore so that is uh from economical point of view that is one of the challenges that grasslands have other than that forest uh, sorry grass land fires annual grassland fires are also uh creating an offset in species in grasslands because you know uh, some types of grasses uh which have hardy seeds for example will sustain fires more and will uh take dominance in lands where forest or grass fires are more frequent uh so from this point of view uh we have threats and awareness is also a threat in terms of you know public perception that people simply don't consider grasslands as uh, an important ecosystem distinct in its own right that uh, is also a problem so we have perception problem as well what impact does india's afforestation project has on the country's grasslands okay so uh as i mentioned the grasslands are an excellent source of carbon sequestration but the amount of documentation and published work available in this area is 
uh, slightly or maybe not slightly a lot less than what is available in terms of sequestration of carbon through trees and uh, with the carbon sequestration target that every country has adopted india has a target of planting 5 crores trees by end of 2023 so this target cascades down to state level targets and to meet these targets of having done enough tree plantations uh new areas are looked for plantation of trees and often times open grassland areas which again look like they don't have trees so why not plant trees there from this sort of a mindset many of these areas have been uh, converted to forest or have been tried to convert it to be converted to forest which often also is not very successful because the the very reason trees don't grow there in the first place is because that environment and the depth of soil and the uh, rainfall patterns are not simply not suitable for trees to grow, grow there actually so often times these reforestation uh, projects also eventually fail or result in trees that not reaching their full potential or introduction of trees that are not native in that area and so on so i think to uh Uh, forestation projects that are in some sense unplanned as to where they should occur uh, one of the prominent grassland species which the trust works with is the indian plain wolf so what are some of the major threats faced by the species so um one of the threats faced by the indian wolf is hybridization uh, we recently published uh, a paper a research paper on the hybridization of the indian wolf um so wolves here uh, breed with uh, free ranging dogs and uh, we 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 also think that they uh, they also produce fertile offspring so we we are regularly monitoring some packs around uh, maharashtra uh, which which are a mix of free ranging dogs and wolves so we we are actually seeing packs which stay with dogs so it's it's quite concerning because if the gene pool of wolves and dogs gets mixed up um the the disease transfer of diseases like rabies and canine distemper virus which is already concerning uh the the risk of these diseases getting transferred will will be more than right now uh once there are hybrids between wolves and dogs so uh, that is hybridization is one of the threats um then again related to uh the free ranging dogs versus wolves problem uh free ranging dogs also happen to uh kill indian wolf pups whenever there's a chance for them uh they also compete for food sources uh with wolves and because of the, this competition uh it could also drive away some local populations uh another threat for the wolf is uh, as makrand explained a threat to the grasslands overall is development pressure and infrastructure pressure so um as as our cities and states develop uh, we'll be getting in new airports new roads bigger roads ring roads highways and um so as compared to previous times when grasslands were very large and unbroken pieces of land where there used to be multiple wolf packs and with with all connecting patches for them to move around from one place to another now the picture has changed a lot uh, because of growing agriculture and infrastructure uh, these grassland patches have become isolated and so it's getting difficult for packs to actually have access to other grasslands in order to reproduce and maintain the population talk about the grassland trust wolf radio calling experience this was an interesting project and um, It was quite unique at that time because uh, none of us had experience of actually uh, getting to trap an animal and uh, see even even get to touch the animal it was amazing. Um, but so this project was conducted by Wildlife Institute of India and BH Lab from Dehradun, and uh, the Grasslands Trust were involved in wildlife tracking, uh, actual collaring of some of the wolves, uh, logistics of the project in our local areas. and also film making we've also made a film about the whole coloring project and uh, a research paper based on the behavioral findings and the home range of the indian wolf 
will soon be published by Mr. Shahir Khan from Wildlife Institute of India. What are some other wolf conservation projects the Grassland Trust is, is involved with? So uh, the Grassland Trust has uh, collaborated with one of the recent in one of the recent projects uh, with uh, Max Planck Institute from Germany, um, and we are using drones. And uh, with the help of drones, we are actually recording videos of Indian wolf packs, and these videos will then be feeded to an artificial intelligence software, which will then analyze and give out results related to the collective behavior of wolves in general. So this is an innovative project, and whatever the findings are, will be probably first will be out for the first time ever uh, about the Indian wolf. Um, then uh, through through many of our projects, uh, we have been doing a lot of awareness sessions, uh, both in urban urban and rural spaces. So um, we've been actually been interacting with uh, people based in the city and villages about wildlife around their cities or uh, around their villages. So for example, um, recently we spotted a pack of 15 wolves around Pune. And the moment we spotted the pack, we understood that it's it it's it was it was probably the uh, highest number of wolves we've seen in a pack of Indian wolves, and so we we acted quickly and uh, we got in touch with the locals. We understood their concerns about having this huge pack of wolves around their village, and these wolves they predate on the livestock regularly, so they. They're always under the radar and uh, under the radar of the villagers and they, they often visit the village to uh, prey on their livestock at night or sometimes even in the day. Um, so we quickly hosted a, a preventive awareness session so that the people were aware of the conflicts that could happen, uh, that the wolf could predate on their livestock and the damage could increase. But we also uh, roped in the forest department and they helped the people understand about the compensations which they can get if, in case their livestock is killed by a wolf. The only thing that they needed uh, was to have proof of the killing. And uh, the government, after approving the uh, the incident, uh, after analyzing the incident, uh, they the, the local villagers can get compensation uh, about till about 70-75% of their loss within a month's time. So uh, that, that was a really interesting awareness session that we had recently. And we've been, uh, a lot of other awareness sessions have been done um, related to leopard and uh, human conflict um, in areas because uh, sugarcane has been taking over grasslands and leopards have sort of started using sugarcane fields for breeding. Uh, and uh, they've been spread out from forests into these sugarcane fields. And as the sugarcane fields expand into grasslands, the leopard population is also increasing. So we've been doing some preventive awareness sessions in different villages for leopards as well. Apart from uh, the awareness sessions, uh, we've also been doing filmmaking regularly. Uh, so as I said, since starting off in 2009, we've been documenting all our observations, uh, not only on paper, in the form of data, but also in the form of photos and videos. And we've been using these photos and videos to create films to raise awareness in villages. And we've actually also dubbed some films uh, or rather uh, narrated them in Marathi uh, as well as English so that we can teach the local population in the language of their preference. And uh, we've also been publishing these regularly on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. Um, apart from filmmaking and social media, uh, I mentioned that we recently published a research paper about the hybridization of Indian wolves. Um, and we've also been working on policy advocacy. So we've been trying to push a uh, grassland policy uh, to the government through its different departments, like the forest department and corporations. And this we're doing uh, in collaboration with uh, ATRI, which Makran uh, briefly introduced. ATRI is an organization based in Bangalore, and it's a 25-year-old organization. So they are helping us uh, scientifically direct our projects in the right direction and also get in touch with government officials to push uh, grassland conservation as a policy. 
and um, apart from that uh, related to awareness we've also been tying up with some international level filmmakers so some people who have worked for bbc some people who have worked with nat geo etc uh, who are actually helping globally to put the spotlight on grasslands and they need to conserve them and um, apart apart from uh, the projects that we have been doing one i'd like to mention one upcoming project which is of great importance and probably uh, it it is the sole reason why the grassland trust was started uh, in 2009 uh, from from 2009 and we we actually uh, registered our trust formally in 2018 um, so we started this trust because we wanted to conserve the grasslands and uh, the apex predator of the grassland which is the indian wolf so our upcoming project will be the state wolf conservation plan which will be a maharashtra wide state wolf conservation plan uh, which will be done in collaboration with atri from bangalore and the maharashtra forest department so this project has received an approval from the maharashtra forest department but we're just waiting for a last clearance from the ministry um, so this will be a 3 to 5 year project which will involve protection of den sites that is the breeding sites of wolves which are the most vulnerable Uh, that's so breeding is the time when wolves are most vulnerable to uh, any sort of threat and if we end up protecting these den sites the wolf population literally gets protected so den site monitoring is one of the things we'll be doing in this project the second thing is we'll be doing some more research on hybridization across the state so we'll get to know uh, the percentage of hybridization all across the state in indian wolves uh thirdly there will be grassland restoration involved in the state wolf conservation plan as well then there will be eco tourism involved in it uh there will be some community conservation involved in it we'll be involving the local communities uh, we'll be asking them to start homestays uh train them to start homestays um, bring in some guides to promote eco tourism and also get involved in grassland restoration projects so they'll get income out of grasslands um and so this project will be run based on pilot surveys done in pune district and uh, these once the pilot surveys are done um this the the same action will be probably replicated across 10 districts in maharashtra uh, uh, and the project will operate with the help of satellite teams uh, based in these uh, the districts of maharashtra including pune so uh, for this project we are although we are we will probably be funded by the government uh but for it to be sustainable uh, we'll require some more funding so we are actually actively looking for funding from corporate companies through their csr funds so another large carnivore found in india's grasslands are the striped tigers so what are the primary threats to the species and what is the grassland trust doing to conserve the hyenas right so um about hyenas uh, we we've actually uh, radio collared some Uh, actually gps collared some hyenas recently some striped hyenas uh, this is also in collaboration with a3 from bangalore they have been uh, they have their field station in baramati in maharashtra and uh, um, they have been doing a lot of meso carnivore collaring so meso carnivores usually involve um, animals which aren't as large as a tiger um, this involves animals like hyenas um, jackals jungle cats indian foxes so uh, we we have been actively uh, doing this collaring project of striped hyenas with it and um regarding the threats that hyenas face um one of the threats is prosecution uh, from locals so because there isn't a lot of awareness about grasslands and the species that live on grasslands people don't know a lot about the behavior of the striped hyena um and across across these uh 10 10 15 years we've we've interacted with a lot of locals where they we we noted that a lot of rumors get circulated about animals some people and because the hyena is so secretive it is it is uh it is crepuscular so it's mainly active at night and it uh, scavenges or hunts at night um people actually see it rarely and at night because there isn't a lot of good visibility around villages um they tend to sometimes mistake it with tiger so because it has a striped pattern some people even call it a tiger in some villages um in in other villages people are just 
cared that it will attack them um, it will attack their livestock and that's why some people uh, even try to prosecute it out of their own agricultural farms and this uh, leads to some human and uh, human and animal conflict between hyenas and people hyenas end up after after being provoked hyenas may end up attacking someone and then people revolt back and actually kill hyenas by beating them up that's that's a really sad part and apart from that uh, as i mentioned for wolves infrastructure is also one of the threats uh, the growing infrastructure of india in general is a threat for animals like hyena so we often encounter a lot of road kills so animals that are killed by uh, because uh, because of being hit by vehicles is one of the threats and um, due to the change of uh, land use pattern from grasslands to agriculture because there is as i said a lot of sugarcane coming in the leopard population in these areas around pune's grasslands is increasing a lot and because the leopards are increasing animals like wolves and hyenas uh, are getting sort of dominated by leopards and moving out of their areas and we are seeing less and less uh, number of wolves and hyenas in areas where we have actually in the past seen them predominantly so how can individuals contribute to grasslands trust so um individuals can contribute by getting in touch uh, with us for, for conducting first is conducting awareness sessions about wildlife human animal conflict in your local area uh, which means maybe urban or rural both uh, then you can get in touch with us with your need to restore a local degraded grassland patch uh, you can also get in touch with us with your research project ideas related to grasslands if you are a researcher um if you are an ngo you can collaborate with us on projects with your area of expertise uh, you can also volunteer with us uh, help us out with data management research policy advocacy grassland restoration activities like actually preparing some grass seed banks and also planting grasses uh, you can also volunteer for our upcoming state wolf conservation plan if you are an active wildlife tracker living in any of the grassland dominated districts of maharashtra Uh, get in touch with us and the last but most important is donations so uh, in order to actually be able to do some real conservation in this field our team needs to be on field for a lot of time so um, i think till now we we've, we've been on our team has been on field for more than say roughly 1000 days plus we've uh, monitored um, say more than 50 wolf packs around maharashtra um and the end per, uh, the end result which is conservation is our research is possible only when there is someone tracking this wildlife and keeping a watch on them so uh, for our team to be monitoring and documenting wildlife around grasslands for studying the grasslands and taking scientific action for conserving the habitat biodiversity and communities which depend on these grasslands donations are of utmost need so that's the main way where you can contribute to the grassland trust That was a fine question I had for you today. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out for this interview. Thank you so much, Anish. Uh, the pleasure is ours, and uh, it's important to raise awareness about grasslands. And I hope this podcast falls on ears who don't know a lot about grasslands but would like to know some things about it and actually help us out conserve help us out to uh, conserve it. Thank you, Anish. If you enjoyed this episode of Think Wildlife podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share this episode.